Hello, everybody. My name is Chad Bacarby, and you reached Faithful Performance. Uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, today. Shabbat Shalom to everybody out there. As we go through a video, really discovering what today, which is Tammuz 17th, is all about with the three it's weeks. About with the three weeks. Excuse me. With the three weeks of sorrow going to the ninth of Av. It's called the Dire Straits. The three weeks of mourning. Some people call it the three weeks of sorrow but it's really from Tammuz 17th today to three weeks from now, which is the 9th of Av. And we're gonna really bring out a prophecy that a lot of people overlook uh, when we look at Tammuz 17th and also the 9th of Av in Zechariah 8. So if you have your Holy Bible, we will be uh, discovering Zechariah 8, 18 through 20, and also going through the events that have happened on these uh, cursed days or fast days uh, that the Lord God wants us to understand. So uh, thank everybody for joining us on this Saturday. I hope everybody's having a great weekend, but we'll begin by looking at Zechariah 8. Um, it's an amazing prophecy about the millennial kingdom. So when you read the entire prophecy, it's obvious that it's speaking about when Yeshua, uh, Jesus will return for his thousand year reign, his millennial reign uh, on earth, on David's everlasting throne. And we're going to see how amazing uh, what's going to happen in the millennial kingdom with Tammu 17th, also the ninth of Av, and other fast days that the prophet Zechariah wants us to understand. Uh, first and foremost, when we look at these prophecies with uh, the months, you know, the fifth month, the fourth month, the third month, whatever it may be, we have to understand that's on God's calendar. That's on the biblical calendar. It's not talking about January, February, or March. It's talking about his months and his calendar. So first and foremost, that's one of the reasons we keep saying on these videos that we have to understand uh, God's calendar to understand some of these prophecies in the Holy Bible, or they will not make sense because he will uh, be on his calendar and not mankind's calendar when all of these things are fulfilled. So if you have your Holy Bible, we'll look at Zechariah 8, and then we'll get into how these days became fast days or cursed days that will eventually turn into feast days, joyful festivals uh, when he returns. So Zechariah 8, 18 through 20, it says, Then the word of the Lord of hosts came to me, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, The fast of the fourth month, the fast of the fifth, the fast of the seventh, and the fast of the tenth, shall be joyful, gladness, and cheerful feast." for the house of Judah, therefore love, truth, and peace. This is such an amazing prophecy and it just, uh, it really does something to my heart because what's gonna transition as we will see from a fast day, a cursed day, to a joyful feast day. But that's what the prophet says, that when you read the entire prophecy, and I would encourage you to do that, you know, in your own time, it's definitely a millennial kingdom chapter, uh, obviously. And uh, when you look at it, it says the fast of the fourth, it is speaking of today. Tammuz 17th is the day that it's speaking about. And then it says the fast of the fifth, which is talking about the ninth of Av in the fifth month on the biblical calendar. And then it goes on to talk about the fast of the seventh month. Okay, and then the fast of the 10th month as well. And then we get this such an amazing uh, a gift that they will be joyful, they will be gladness, they will be cheerful feast. Some of the sages say that they will be more cheerful and more joyful than even the divine appointments are, Passover, because they've been cursed for so long that they will be elevated into that joyful feast day. Now, whether that's true or not, it really amplifies the fact that they're going to be cheerful. They're going to be turned from weeping, mourning, fasting to joyful, cheerful, and festival. So we have to understand that the Lord wants us to be a part of it. Um, I was born a Gentile, so I get the question all the time, why do you celebrate, you know, or why do you fa not celebrate? Why do you fast on these days? Well, for me, it's not really about fasting because of the temples. It's the reason why the temples were destroyed. The reason why uh, God, you know, chastised them and judged them so hard is because they didn't follow the Torah and also because of the rejection of Yeshua 
in, when the second temple was destroyed in 70 AD. So for me, it's really about God and understanding what he wants all of us, Jew and Gentile, to understand. And, and other than that, uh, like I've said before, we're all grafted into the commonwealth of Israel. You know, in Ephesians 2, it says that, that we were once strangers from the covenant. And now we're in the commonwealth or the kingdom of Israel, as I like to call it. And that kingdom will be uh, during the millennial kingdom when he re restores the kingdom to Israel in Acts 1. Uh, the disciples asked him that, and he said, it's not for you to understand those times, but he will restore the kingdom to Israel. Jew and Gentile are part of that. So my question to any believer would be, if he wants us to remember these days, fast these days, then we will celebrate these days as well. I don't know if it would be uh, kosher or fair if we just want to celebrate, but we don't want to remember. You know, that's what most of mankind wants to do all the time is we want the good, but we don't want to understand how to get to that uh, good, so to speak, and go through the understanding of why the temples were destroyed, why did he exile them, et cetera, et cetera. Why were these days fast days? And we're going to get into the scriptures of that. So Tammuz 17th is today, July 16th. For three weeks, it goes into uh, the three weeks of sorrow, the dire straits, three weeks of mourning. Uh, there's different sayings for these three weeks, but it ends on the 9th of Av, which is July. I'm sorry, it's on August 6th. Okay, so it's from July 16th, uh, 16th to August 6th. And uh, we have to understand this is very important time. As we mentioned in the new moon celebration, this is a time of judgment. However, for the believers that are doing God's will, this is a good judgment, uh, not a bad judgment as we discovered in the new moon uh, video. But it's so important to recognize these things because guess what? If we're gonna be in the millennial kingdom and uh, we're gonna celebrate these days and we don't have any understanding of why these days are being celebrated, uh, I believe that uh, we might look foolish, <laughs> so to speak. So we wanna really dive into and pray into these beautiful things of the Lord. Remember why the temples were destroyed. Why did he chastise uh, the people back in both, when both temples were destroyed, etc. The reason for that, and as we will see, is idolatry. You know, it's turning away from the Lord. It's turning away from Torah. And for the second temple, it was turning away from Yeshua, you know, the atonement of sin, you know, at his first coming event. So it's so important. But as far as Tammuz 17th is concerned, uh, this all started, this day started in the book of Exodus. You know, it all goes back into Genesis and Exodus when we look at it. But this Tammuz 17th became a fast day, became a cursed day, uh, Tammuz 17th did because of the golden calf. If you're not familiar with the story, uh, I'll try to lead you up to it. But when the children of Israel were released from bondage, when the Lord and Moses uh, delivered them from bondage in Egypt, they traveled 50 days uh, to Mount Sinai. They received the Torah, as we all know, and uh, they committed to the Lord. They said, yes, we will follow you. There was a bridal uh, arrangement. It was a marriage you know, between God and the people through the Torah. Well, when Moses went back up for the next 40 days, uh, the children of Israel got impatient. Uh, they wanted Moses to return. They didn't know what happened to him, etc. And that's when they petitioned Aaron uh, to make a golden calf uh, for them from the gold that they had uh, received from the people of Egypt. So here we are at Mount Sinai. They received the Ten Commandments. Moses goes back up for 40 days. The people are impatient, okay? And they really weren't cleansed enough or mature enough in their faith to overcome these temptations, etc. And Aaron, of course, wasn't strong enough as well. And he uh, built the golden calf for them. You know, he told them to take off all the golden earrings, etc., threw it in the fire, and the calf came out, uh, as we know. And then the Lord God Almighty, you know, at the top of Mount Sinai, told Moses to go down there and see what the people were doing. And that's when he went down uh, to, and he broke the Ten Commandments. And that was on Tammuz 17th, which is today. So, 3,300 years ago or whatever it may be, this is the anniversary uh, of the golden calf where, uh, you know, where they uh, basically were in sin against the Lord. Moses came down and it became a cursed day uh, in Jewish history, as we will see. And what's amazing when you look at Exodus 32, and I know we're probably all familiar with the golden calf story, but what really sticks out to me in Exodus 32 verse five it says this, and this is so amazing. 
So when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, talking about the golden calf. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. I find that very interesting. So he says tomorrow, he's talking about Tammuz 17th, the same day that Moses came down after they were worshiping the golden calf. So I find it very interesting that they were wanting to proclaim a festival or a feast day on Tammuz 17th and God cursed that feast day. You know, he cursed it and then it will become a fast day until the millennial kingdom and then he will turn it into his feast day. So I find it very interesting when we read the Holy Bible that it really goes in order of how God works, but that's very paramount to understand in Exodus 32 verse 5 that tomorrow is a festival, a feast day to the Lord. And God said, no, it's going to be a fast day and it's going to be a cursed day. And then in the millennial kingdom, I'm going to turn into my festival, his festival uh, that he wants us to uh, celebrate with him while he's on earth. So I think it's totally phenomenal. And we know the story when uh, after Tammuz 17th, Moses uh, crushed the golden calf, uh, grinded it to powder, put it in the water. He made them drink it, which was pretty interesting. And then uh, the Levites slaughtered 3,000 people that were against the Lord God, you know, for the golden calf instant. And we know the rest of the story. Moses went back up, petitioned for really 80 days and then came back down on Yom Kippur and said, everything is forgiven and let's go inherit the promised land, uh, so to speak, which there was some, we'll get into that next as they failed one more time on the ninth day of Av. So it's so important to recognize God's calendar, where we are on his calendar, to be intimate with him. And on these fast days are very important for all believers to understand, to fast, to remember the reason why the temples were destroyed. The reason why this day became a curse day, became a fast day. And ever since that time, uh, there's been some events that have happened uh, that has caused this to be a curse day. Uh, obviously, Moses broke the Ten Commandments on Tammuz 17th. Then he went back up on Tammuz 18th for 80 days, 40 days and 40 more days. And that's what we have to understand about the story of uh, Mount Sinai, Moses, the Ten Commandments is 40 days, he went up, came back, crushed the golden calf and the Ten Commandments, went back up for 40 days, came back down. There was no reassurance of the forgiveness. And then he went back up on a Lu one and was up there for 40 days until Yom Kippur, okay, which is in the fall. If you're not familiar with it, he came back down. Everything was atoned for and he interceded for him. And we can get great understanding of that as well, that this is a great time to intercede, you know, for ourselves, but our families, our friends and everything, just like Moses did. And we'll do a video on that here throughout the summer about the uh, foreshadow of how Moses interceded and reminded God of the promises of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and David uh, to him. I mean, Moses petitioned to him. It's a phenomenal story when you read Exodus 32 about Moses's heart. You know, he wanted to be blot out of the book instead of the people. You know, so the heart of Moses, we can really dive into with Exodus 32, and it's such an amazing uh, passage. But some of the events that have happened on Tammuz 17th on this day, and statistically is pretty amazing, is that's when Moses broke the Ten Commandments uh, during the Babylonian siege of Jerusalem in 586 BC. Uh, basically, they, the Jews were forced to cease the offering of the daily sacrifices due to the lack of sheep. Nebuchadnezzar had uh, the city surrounded, you know, he was about to breach the walls, etc., and destroy the city from God's command. So that happened on Tammuz 17th. Uh, also, Apostomos. Uh, burned the Holy Torah on this day as well, on Tammuz 17th. An idol was placed in the Holy Temple on this day, Tammuz 17th. And also the walls of Jerusalem were breached by the Romans with the second destruction in, 69, in AD 69 uh, after a lengthy siege. And then obviously three weeks later after the Jews uh, put up a struggle with them, uh, the Romans destroyed the second holy temple on the night of Av, which we will discover uh, later on here in the video. But also the Jerusalem Talmud 
maintains that this is also the date when the Babylonians breached the walls of Jerusalem on their way to destroying the first temple. So there's a lot of connections here between the Babylonian destruction and also the Roman destruction, 586 BC to 70 AD. Okay, there's a lot of similarities with those two destructions because they happen, key events happen on the Tammuz 17th with the Romans and also with the Babylonians. And then the ultimate destruction was on the ninth of Av with both temples, which we're about to discover. So Tammuz 17th, again, started out as a fast day, curse day because of the golden calf. And since that time, it will be a fast day, even though they wanted it to be a feast day to the Lord. He said, no, it's a curse day. It's a fast day until my son returns for his millennial kingdom. And in Zechariah 8, it says that they will be, that Tammuz 17th will be a festival, it will be a gladful, cheerful feast, uh, so to speak. So uh, that will be a joyous uh, day for sure. So now when we look at uh, the ninth of Av, so three weeks later, again, that's why it's called the three weeks of sorrow, the dire straits, the three weeks of mourning. There's other names as well, but these three weeks are a time of reflection, like I said, of the reasons why the temples were destroyed, not the the physical temples, even though we can remember that as well. It's really the reason why the people were judged and chastised is because of idolatry, the golden calf. And look what they were doing with the Babylonian, before the Babylonian invasion, idolatry, Baal, along with other things, but uh, idolatry for sure. And so the same thing cycled over and over from the golden calf onto Baal, onto uh, Moloch, you know, with the sacrificing of the children. So idolatry comes in different forms, but it's the same thing. Okay, golden calf, bell, it's all the same. It's all evil. So God's getting our attention. So the, the way that I personally like to look at it as well from a personal level is what golden calf do I have in my life, you know, this year that I need to break or golden calves, if there's more than one to really petition the Lord as well. So when someone asks me why I do uh, fast on Tammu 17th and the 9th of Av, uh, even though I'm not uh, born Jewish, is number one, I'm in the Commonwealth of Israel and I want to celebrate these events with the Lord and also the other believers. So we need to have a basic understanding of the reasons what we're talking about is why were the temples destroyed? Uh, do I have any golden calves in my life, uh, so to speak? So that's how I personally like to look at it and not to get into all of this, uh, the Jews here and the Gentiles, their conversation, you know, because again, the body is one, not two different bodies. There's only one body and we all need to be uh, understanding what the Lord's trying to tell us uh, on these key events on his calendar. So now when we look three weeks later, you know, into the ninth of Av, uh, some will call this the most cursed day in Jewish history. And when we go through the statistics, I think that we can all agree uh, with that because statistically, I mean, it's amazing. You know, it just will not happen as far as statistics that this one day all these bad events happened uh, to a certain group of people. I mean, it's astronomical about the statistic uh, factor here. So uh, just keep that in mind as we go. But most people understand that this is when the spies, the 10 spies bought, brought back the bad report. And that is in Numbers 13, uh, chapters 13 and 14. And you can read that for yourself. Uh, it is amazing. We probably, most of us know the story that after the golden calf incident, they went to inherit the promised land. Uh, Moses sent 12 spies, one from each tribe uh, to go scope out the land. Uh, the promised land to basically test them, I believe. I think the Lord uh, petitioned Moses to do that, to test their faith, to, taste, to test their strength in the Lord and to overcome their fear, overcome their, uh, basically if they were fearing, if they didn't have the faith that the Lord was going to deliver them. Uh, as we know, they went into the land, they saw the giants, they saw the fruit of the land, etc. but they could not overcome the fear of the sons of Anak, uh, the giants of the land. They couldn't overcome it, 10 of them. So when they came back to Moses, 10 of the spies brought back a bad report and then Joshua and Caleb brought, uh, Caleb, uh, brought back the good report. You know, and what happened? Joshua and Caleb and their descendants, they were able to inherit their promised land and the other 10 tribes at that time uh, they were going to die in the desert. You know, the Lord was not going to allow them to inherit the promised land because of their faith and their fear of the giants and they didn't have the faith in him. So we have to understand this is a very important date, the ninth of Av. And I believe these two days, the ninth of Av and the Tammuz 17th 
we're going to see some events at the end of the age that will occur on these days. And we have seen that in recent history, some important de uh, events uh, that have happened on uh, the ninth of off. So that's kind of the backstory of it, that 10 of the spies brought back the bad report, Joshua and Caleb, the good report. And uh, again, they were the ones who inherited the promised land and the others were not. Uh, what I come to find out that just comes to my mind is so interesting that since Joshua and Caleb brought back the good report, only two spies, in the book of Joshua, when he sent out the spies to uh, Jericho, uh, when they visited Rahab, there was only two that were sent. And I've always found that that was an interesting uh, correlation between the two spies that brought back the good report and Joshua only sent two spies and not 12 spies uh, to Jericho to scope out the land before the walls were uh, broken down. But some of the events that have happened on the ninth of Av, and it's pretty amazing, there's a whole list of them, is obviously this is when the spies brought back the bad report, which established this as a fast day or a cursed day uh, in Jewish history. And again, it's going to turn into a feast day, the fast of the fifth. Av is the fifth month. So it's going to be a feast day in the millennial kingdom, just like the fourth month is Tammuz, and that will be a feast day as well. But this is when both holy temples were destroyed on the same exact day. So if you can think about that, out of all of the days of the year, uh, one day both temples were destroyed. Again, it's a God thing. He's trying to get our attention to understand that this day is very important now as a fast day, but also in the future uh, when we celebrate with him, excuse me, in the millennial kingdom as a feast day. But this is also when the uh, Simon Bar Koda, uh, Koba, I believe, I can't pronounce his name, but um, this is when the Battle of Batar happened uh, with Simon Bar Koba, I believe is how you pronounce it. And then a year later on the same exact day, the 9th of Av, this is when the Romans plowed over the Temple Mount. You know, so again, the Temple Mount was already, uh, they plowed over it a year after uh, the Battle of Batar. In 1290 AD, this is when the Jews were expelled from England on the ninth day of Av, and that was July 18th was the Gregorian calendar date. Uh, also, the Jews were expelled from France on July 22nd, 1306. Uh, the Jews were expelled from Spain as well uh, on July 31st, uh, 1492. Actually, it was August 2nd on the ninth day of Av uh, when you read the history books. Uh, so that was during the Spanish Inquisition where uh, Spain expelled the Jews or they had to convert to Catholicism. Uh, the next one was Germany, World War I. Germany declared war on Russia uh, entering and entered into World War I on August 1st and 2nd, which is off 9th and 10th, and that was in 1914, uh, which caused a massive upheaval uh, in European Jewelry and whose aftermath obviously was not good, that obviously eventually led into the Holocaust. And speaking of that, on August 2nd, 1941, which is the ninth day of Av, um, that's when the final solution was uh, ordered uh, with the Nazi party, which began uh, the Holocaust, which is one third of the Jewish people uh, perished uh, during that time. Six million Jewish people perished at that time. Uh, as we go uh, further up, up to date, uh, in, on July 23rd, 1942, on the ninth day of Av, uh, there was a mass deportation of Jews from uh, the Warsaw uh, Ghetto uh, en route to Treblinka. And then as we get closer to our date in 1994, July 18th, there was a bombing of a Jewish community center in Buenos Aires. Uh, that killed 85 Jewish people and injured 300. And then the most recent one that we see is in 2005, uh, the Israeli disengagement from Gaza or the evacuation of the Jewish people from Gaza, which is the land of the tribe of Judah, which is Yeshua's land. You know, and y'all remember, I don't know if most remember that, but that's when George Bush uh, told Ariel Sharon to evacuate uh, from Gaza and 48 hours later, uh, we were evacuating New Orleans from Hurricane Katrina. You know, that's what happens is, it's called eye for eye and tooth for tooth, you know, with the Lord is what happened, what you do to Israel is gonna happen to you. And uh, mentioned on that note, there was a guy who wrote a book, Bill Koenig, 
who wrote a book eye to eye that mentioned every time the U.S. Uh, did something against Israel within 24 to 48 hours, we had that same judgment or a judgment upon our land. It's a phenomenal book. It's called Eye to Eye uh, by Bill Koenig. And it's, it's amazing at how many times, again, bless those who bless you and curse those who curses you. You know, eye for eye, that's how the Lord works. And he will get his uh, vengeance on a nation who does something uh, against his people, against Israel. So this is an interesting thing. When you look at every event that happened on the 9th of Av, statistically, it's unimaginable. It's amazing. It's a God thing, you know, but he's trying to get our attention to understand that the 9th day of Av and Tammuz 17th will be cursed days, fast days. It's not good days until we get to the millennial kingdom uh, with Messiah. Uh, to turn these feast days in, or these fast days into feast days. So now if we read Zechariah 8 again with understanding uh, the judgments uh, of these things, with the golden calf, with the idolatry, uh, with what happened at the first destruction, with idolatry with Baal, with Moloch, etc. What happened with the second destruction, with the Romans, with uh, the rejection of Messiah, Yeshua, and also with idolatry, turning away from Torah. When you read this prophecy, it really sticks out when we understand the events that have happened now with the both destructions on the temple the same day, the same exact day, and then all of these other uh, events that were casualties, that were bad events. Now when we read it, it should have a little bit more heartfelt uh, message to all of us. And this is what it says, uh, Zechariah 8, 18 through 20, it says, Then the word of the Lord of hosts came to me, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, The fast of the fourth, the fast of the fifth, the fast of the seventh, and the fast of the tenth shall be joyful, gladness, and cheerful feast for the house of Judah. Therefore, love, truth, and love, peace. Amen. So I hope that really resonates even more now since we understand the events that have happened on this day biblically and also the events that have happened after after these days turn into cursed days but let not your heart be troubled they will be joyful feast days and i wanted to bring this out it was just an amazing scripture uh, that i was reading and uh, every year this time i go through that i've not done a video on it so i wanted to bring this to light today uh, i hope everybody's had a good uh, shabbat uh, a good uh, Sabbath uh, today, uh, wherever you may be. So if anybody has any comments or any questions, uh, I'll stick around and uh, we can conversate over whatever topic there may be um, out there. But uh, this is an amazing prophecy. If you read the entire chapter, you really get the full glimpse of it. Uh, so I would encourage you to do it. And it's just an amazing uh, time to understand how God is viewing uh, these three weeks and how God is viewing this in the future, you know, for all of us to understand and for all of us to cleanse and all of us to repent if there's any golden calves in our lives or if there's anything that we need to turn away from, you know, during this time so that, you know, we're on this purification journey, you know, until we meet him. Let me see here. I think my internet is uh, kind of messing up here. We've got a bad thunderstorm where I am. So let me uh, refresh. I know there were some comments made, uh, but I do not see them. Uh, now I see them. Uh, now they've popped up. So uh, let's see. Uh, Olga, shalom to you. Hey, Denise, shalom. Uh, yes, John, this is live. Shabbat Shalom to you, Alicia. Cynthia, hello, Shalom. Matt, it's good to see you. It's been a while, man. I hope you're doing well. I hope your family's doing well. Wow, that's very good. That's very good. So the Supreme Court, yeah, I knew it was June 25th or somewhere in there, so that was on the ninth day of all. That's amazing. Uh, I didn't know that, but I'll definitely put it in the notes. Thanks, Matt. Wow. Uh, Vincent, uh, this is the time of the wheat harvest now. Not two months ago, time for the restrainer. Okay. Alicia, when was the period of fasting supposed to be? Do we fa Yeah, so there's a lot of debate on that, Felicia. You know, if you read most commentaries, they do not want you to uh, fast on the Sabbath. And this is obviously Tammuz 17th fell on a Sabbath um, 
this year. So I would just encourage you to seek the Lord on that. Uh, and ask the Holy Spirit to lead you uh, with that. Because some people will say, well, it doesn't say except for the Sabbath in the scriptures of Zechariah 8. But um, at the same time, I know there's different commentaries. So I would um, just encourage you to ask the Holy Spirit uh, if it's okay to fast on the Shabbat or wait until the next day, which is Sunday, to um, to fast and to uh, observe Zechariah 8. Let's see. Oh, Olga. Hey, truck girl, good to see you again. Yes, Matt. Yeah, I know it was twenty, the June twenty fifth or the twenty sixth that they, um, the Supreme Court ordained or legalized uh, same sex marriage uh, in our uh, thing. But there's a unique uh, tie in to the ninth day of Av, and I know a lot of people have written some books about it. But if you just read the scriptures and understand. Um, Zechariah 8 and also understand obviously the the 10 spies story of how it became a cursed day then you know we'll understand what Zechariah 8 it is about and also the events that have happened on this day I mean it's just um, it's mind-boggling how one day could be that cursed uh, you know or on the year you know that there's however you want to look at it 360 365 or however many days people want to go by um, one day is that cursed. It's, it's just really mind boggling, but it was because of the 10 spies, uh, so to speak. Um, let's see if anybody else has any comments. Thank you, Alicia. Yeah, really, when it comes down to um, everybody's individual convictions, I always just tell them to, you know, ask the Holy Spirit, you know, um, you know, cause there's a lot of commentary out there, whether they're Orthodox, Messianic, or even a Gentile believer, uh, they have different views on uh, fasting, especially when it comes to the holy days and uh, the Shabbat days, uh, so to speak. Vincent, uh, Numbers 12, if there's a prophet among you who I will make myself known to him in a vision and speak to him in the dream. Such a great experience I've had several times. Uh, absolutely. It's amazing, uh, Vincent. I, I was reading that scripture the, the other day because it was part of the Torah portion. You know, and we're on, I think the Torah portion right now is on uh, Balak and Balaam and uh, that story in Numbers 22. But uh, yeah, a few weeks ago we had that um, in Numbers 12 and I remember reading it. And uh, it's pretty amazing, you know, when you uh, read the scripture and how people view that and how people understand that today with prophets and with dreams, et cetera. It's really out of hand in a way. And I wish more people would read uh, that scripture in Numbers 12 um, uh, like you have. So thank you for sharing that. Does anybody else have any comments or any questions about uh, Zechariah 8 or really anything? You know, this is an open conversation uh, that we can have on really any topic. But uh, if you have anything on Zechariah 8 or the ninth day of Av, Tammuz 17th, any revelation kind of like Matt did uh, with the Supreme Court in uh, same-sex marriage, uh, please feel free. I love this. You know, um, I can put it in my uh, stats for the next, uh, next year to go, to go through as well. Excuse me. Oh, Sally, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I've never heard of that. That uh, also the five stones that David picked up or picked from the river to defeat Goliath is symbolic for the first five books in the Bible, the Torah. That's pretty amazing. That's that's great. Thank you for sharing that. The church departure will be in Cancer. Well, there's a lot of obviously a lot of debate on that with uh, in a, in many facets with the rapture of the church or the resurrection of. Uh, the believers, etc., uh, so to speak. So, uh, yeah, that'll open up a can. Of, we'll be here all night talking about the rapture and the resurrection. But you know, everybody has their own convictions on that. Uh, I personally believe that that will occur on the Feast of Trumpets. You know, the rapture, resurrection, however you want to call it, uh, it will be on the Feast of Trumpets. I think the scriptures really point towards that area with uh, the last trumpet. You know, etc. Uh, we all know that scripture. Um, so to speak, in the Corinthians and the Thessalonians that Paul speaks of. Uh, but I personally believe that will be on the Lord's feast days, um, the divine appointments that he will return on. Uh, but, you know, again, God knows best, and we all just have to keep watching and paying attention. 
Shalom to you, Marcia. We won't hold you to it. I know you're late, but that's okay. Thank you for joining us tonight and uh, on this Sabbath. Thank you so much. Does anybody else have any comments or uh, anything? Uh, here we go. Uh, yes, I totally believe this, that uh, the church's departure is imminent. You know, I, I believe when I say imminent, I believe it's in the next several years. I believe we can really expect something amazing to happen. Remember, you know, we're on the Shemitah year right now. And uh, I'm glad you mentioned that, Sally, that we're on uh, the Shemitah year this year, which is the seventh year of the seven year cycle, which is called the Shemitah year. Um, you know, so to speak, where the land is supposed to rest in Israel, not anywhere else, but in Israel, etc. They have a year off, all of these things, but it does tie into prophecy. It does tie into Daniel's 70th week, uh, so to speak, which is the last seven years of the age. Uh, that's the seven year tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble. I mean, we have all these names for it, but it's really the last Shemitah cycle uh, that will occur before Messiah's second coming events. And uh, so a lot of people are calling for that, going off of what Vincent is saying and other people are saying that a lot of people are calling for uh, the resurrection or the rapture of the church or the seven-year tribulation to begin uh, here on the Feast of Trumpets. I believe it's September 25th. Uh, someone can correct me if I'm a day off or so, but the Feast of Trumpets this year starts a new seven-year cycle. Uh, which is so important to understand uh, because one cycle will be that last cycle. It will be the 70th week of Daniel, the last Shemitah uh, cycle, so to speak. So uh, we'll see what happens um, uh, here in this new cycle on September 25th, because as we know, there will be an agreement made uh, with Israel and with others, you know, and that will begin that seven year period, which obviously will begin on the Feast of Trumpets. You know, the Feast of Trumpets, or the seven year tribulation period will begin on the Feast of Trumpets and it will end on the Feast of Trumpets because that's again what I believe Messiah will return on the Feast of Trumpets. So it's seven exact years on the Feast of Trumpets, 10 days of war, you know, with him by himself, Isaiah 63, by himself, day of vengeance, day of the Lord, and then Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, we will come down with him. That's why in Revelation 19, we come down and work with white only and he has blood on his garments because he's been down for 10 days, Isaiah 63, warring. And then he comes and gets us for the final victory uh, in Yom, on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And then five days later, we will be celebrating the honeymoon um, at the Feast of Tabernacles. And, and that will be the uh, Millennial Kingdom. So it's really a beautiful thing. And we just all need to keep up with the understanding of all of these things with the Shemitah cycle. It's so important to understand the Shemitah cycle. I, I did a video on it, uh, I forget, a week ago or so. Um, and uh, we go through some of these things with the Shemitah cycle, with the understanding of Roe versus Wade, all of these things. There's a lot of events that are occurring right now that's totally amazing. Uh, that goes into prophetic understanding. Some are good, some are bad. But uh, I live in America, so we're trying to get some of these things in our law books overturned, which the abortion was overturned by the Supreme Court. I know it's going to be a fight down in the States. Of course it is. You don't just get rid of something evil like that because of Satan, of course, of all of his dominions, you know, so to speak. So it's going to be a war, uh, but we at least got the Supreme Court, the law of the land, to overturn it as the law of the land. And now it goes down into the states and we will uh, fight there as well. And then we just have to get the same sex marriage overturned. I believe those are the two great national sins that we have. And I know God was smiling on America on the Supreme Court when they overturned uh, the abortion. I think it's one of the greatest days in American history, to be honest with you, uh, because of the spiritual aspects of it. Uh, you don't kill 60, something million kids and think God's gonna smile on your country. So uh, we have to understand that. I, that was really monumental uh, what happened uh, with the overturning of uh, the abortion. And uh, no matter how you look at it, it is uh, 
you know, with individuals, it is murder according to the Holy Bible, as we discovered there uh, in the last video that we did live with the Shemitah. And uh, we will see what happens with the same-sex marriage, uh, so to speak. So uh, one battle at a time, as I like to call it. But it's so important to stay tuned into that Shemitah cycle. And we might do another video close to the new cycle, but I know that we will do a video about the new cycle coming up. And it's amazing when you look at the new seven years coming up and you look at all the signs and the prophetic understanding of the celestial bodies in the sky, you know, I'm talking about the moon and the sun. There's blood moons, there's solar eclipses on these important biblical dates of Hanukkah and also in Purim. You know, I don't find that any coincidence that God has chosen those two uh, under, uh, those two. Uh, dates, those two festivals, so to speak. They're not the divine appointments of the Lord, but they are crucial festivals. And I believe these solar eclipses and these blood moons that are occurring uh, on Hanukkah and Purim in these next seven years uh, is just phenomenal. And the understanding of it is very important. And uh, I'll leave it at that until we go through it on a live video here uh, this fall. Okay, let me see if I can catch up here. Uh, See. Okay, truck girl, 925 new moon feast of trumpets. Okay, yes, thank you, truck girl. Uh, I'm always usually a day off anyhow, so there you go. <laughs> thank you. Uh, we're going home. Yep. That's great, Olga. That is awesome. Uh, so many people like yourself, Olga, are having these dreams or having these visions. And remember what Joel 2, 28 says, that the Holy Spirit is going to be poured out at the end of the age. Dreams, visions, daughters, sons, grandparents, you name it. Everybody's going to receive a dose of revelation, and we need to all share that revelation. So that's why I love to um, congregate with you guys and fellowship with you, open it up, because everybody has great revelation, and don't be afraid to say it. You know, it's, it, don't be afraid to uh, tell people what the Lord has shown you, you know, because no one has all of it. You know, we all work together you know, with understanding what the Lord's trying to tell us through the Holy Bible, through events, through dreams, through visions. So just please uh, use your gift, whatever that gift may be, uh, for the Lord's kingdom. Shalom, Cal Cal. Good to see you. Uh, Sally, I've had two rapture dreams and two millennial kingdom dreams. The spirit is really moving with the remnant in these last days. That is awesome. If you don't mind sharing those with me, um, if you do, that's okay. Uh, they're your personal dreams. But if you don't mind sharing them, please uh, contact me at chat at faithfulperformance.com or really anybody out there. I love, I love hearing revelation that the Lord's uh, giving uh, people because it really edifies me as well and hearing all of these things. So if, you, if anybody doesn't mind sharing anything, just email me at chat at faithfulperformance.com and I would love to um, uh, hear it and read about it. Uh, yes, Vincent, Jeremiah 7, the whole book of Jeremiah, including Jeremiah 7, is very important. And uh, I would encourage all believers to uh, read that because it will happen again. It is a historical but also a prophetic understanding in the book of Jeremiah. It's all bleeded in together and blended in. So it's an amazing book. It's one of my favorite books um, uh, of the Bible as far as the prophets are concerned. Uh, the abortion, yeah. Um, Kel Cow, I just had a super moon. Yep, that's right. Yeah, that's right, Sally. That's one of the reasons where the personal revelation that I personally get, again, we look at these things in different layers. You know, when we read the book of Zechariah or any book of the Bible, there's always a historical, <clears throat> excuse me, a historical, a prophetic, but there's also a personal, you know, revelation as well. And you mentioned it, Sally, that we need to really evaluate ourselves about the golden calves that could be in our lives, you know, and to crush those and to break those. And I think that's a good uh, remembrance of this day of Tammuz 17th personally is to evaluate ourselves like we should be doing uh, the all, all the other days of the year and uh, evaluate what golden cast we might have in our lives. 
Uh, Matt, uh, sorry, look, let me just see. Okay, yeah, no worries, Matt. Yeah, no worries uh, at all. He, he basically, Matt, <clears throat> excuse me, basically Matt just said that he looked it up again and the same-sex marriage law was put into place on July, uh, on July, on June 26, but the night they evolved was on July 26. Okay, no worries. Thanks for clarifying that, Matt. Shabbat Shalom to you, uh, Maria. Uh, Marie, I'm sorry. Eden, North Carolina, what a cool name. Eden. Uh, Tanya, Shabbat Shalom to you. Jesus said that he was the temple will be raised in three days. This is a very powerful time. Amen. I totally believe that. Yes, if you're, you know, whether it's Jew or Gentile, but especially the Jewish people, as you mentioned, you know, to remember the destruction of the holy temples and why they were destroyed and understanding that there will be uh, a temple in the millennial kingdom uh, with the Messiah is totally phenomenal. And absolutely, I totally agree with that. That's, that's very cool. And that's what we need to be praying for as well is, you know, what Tanya's mentioning is very important because there's going to be a deception coming as we, most of us know with the prophecies that there will be a temple built uh, before Messiah comes back. You know, obviously it's going to be desecrated by the Antichrist in the book of Daniel. So we need to be praying for uh, the Jewish people to not be deceived because even the elect will be deceived as Messiah says. So we need to be praying for the leadership of Israel and also the Jewish people, um, you know, with what's, especially what's going on with their government right now. If you keep up with the politics in Israel, uh, the election process, the government is just in a mess over there. I mean, they're on their fifth election uh, so to speak. So we definitely need to be praying uh, for the Jewish people, uh, for God's will to be done, because you can kind of see the transitioning of what, how they could be deceived by what's going on inside of their government. Again, the inside of the government will betray the people, in my opinion, and make that agreement uh, that will be the covenant of death that Isaiah mentions. And I believe it's Isaiah 28 someone can correct me if i'm wrong but there will be a covenant of death and you can see the uh the way the government is it is in very controversy i mean it's it's a it's in shambles over there basically they're on their fifth election in the last couple of years so we have to understand that uh, this is an important time for Israel. It's an important time for the Jewish people. As we proceed to the end of the age, it's very important to be praying for the Jewish people, for the leadership, and for those rent for the remnant to uh, have the great understanding of what's coming. You know what Messiah said was what uh, what is coming. So what a great point, Tanya. Thank you. Stay focused and crooked path straight. You know, that's interesting. That's, um, you know, basically what uh, the scripture of what uh, I believe Isaiah said and also John the Baptist came to do is make the path, pathways of the Lord straight. And that's what we all need to be doing right now uh, with that is making just like the prophets and the, you know, just like the prophets and the priests did back then, or especially the prophets of making the pathway straight to remind people to go back to the Torah to understand God's commandments. Uh, we need to be doing the same thing uh, to make the pathways of the Lord straight, the narrow path, and it is definitely narrow. Uh, the older I get, I, I really believe it gets narrower and narrower as we read that scripture, so to speak. So um, I totally believe that, uh, Kel Cal, about that. Thank you. Uh, Vincent, thank you for that. Sin unto death resolved in Jeremiah 7, 1 John 5, 16. All sin is sin, but there is sin unto death. I'd have you not ask of this. Yes, uh, I totally believe that. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, truck girl, peace and wisdom for Israel. Yes, ma'am. Uh, amen. Yes, Sally. And this, that's an important uh, remark what Sally said as well, two thirds of the Jewish people, according to, again, according to Zechariah, uh, two thirds of the Jewish people would perish. You know, well, what's amazing, that's how important this time is right now, you know, uh, with the understanding of the destruction of the temples, the exiles, there was a lot of people killed in the Babylonian uh, exile and captivity. 
just the same as the Romans uh, in AD 70 as well. So yes, absolutely. There is, if I can say this, and I hate to say this, is when we look at the Jewish people and the population of the Jewish people, which is roughly around 15 to 18 million, okay? And it depends on whoever you look at with statistics. But if you look at that, that is phenomenal. Uh, what uh, that is, it's, it's really amazing that two thirds of them will perish, okay? So if you look at the Holocaust and how bad and terrible it was, you know, six million Jewish people died. I mean, that is, I mean, it's just mind boggling how many people were, were um, killed during that time, uh, the Holocaust. But if you look at it from Zechariah's prophecy, there's a greater Holocaust coming that we need to be praying for the Jewish people. We need to be warning the Jewish people because Zechariah says, just like Sally has mentioned, two thirds of the Jewish people. Okay, so if there's 15 million Jewish people to make the math easy or 18 million to make the math easy, that only five million survive and 10 million will perish. Think about that. So there's a greater Holocaust coming and we need to all be standing with our brethren, our Jewish people, okay? They are the elect. They might be enemies of the gospel, like Paul says right now, as a whole, as a corporate, but like Romans 11 says, they are the elect because of the promises of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we need to understand that. And we, not, we need to understand history and we need to understand Europe. We need to understand the Holocaust and how the Christians really turned a blind eye uh, from what was going on with the gas chambers. They turned a blind eye against them instead of standing with them. Now, I know there was a remnant of the believers, you know, Corey, Corey Tim Boone and all these people that we mentioned that helped out the Jewish people and thousands of others. But as a whole, as a group of believers, as a group of Christians or Gentile Christians, they really turned a blind eye uh, with what was going on, you know, with the Holocaust. And I know that I believe we're going to be living at a time that we're going to have to choose uh, in the future who are you going to stand with. You know, are you going to stand with the public or are you going to stand with the Jewish people? You know, I believe there's going to be a day of that. And I believe we need to all get our hearts and our minds prepared for that of what's going on. But thank you, Sally, for mentioning that because it goes right into what we're speaking about today with Zechariah 8, with the fast of the fourth, the fast of the fifth. This is the reason why is what you're mentioning. It all correlates together with that. Uh, Tanya, I believe there's a betrothal period before the Feast of Trumpets wedding and he will be here uh, with us for it. I'm not disagreeing with that at all. I do believe that as well. Uh, on the timing of it, uh, you know, that's another conversation, but I do uh, agree uh, with your point for sure. Oh yeah, this is good, Sherry. This is very good. Yes, let me, I need to think about this real quick because I just, uh, it was in one, of, it's in one of my articles or books, but um, yes, I believe that is correct. I know that ninth of Av is when one of the events happened. She's talking about, uh, Sherry's talking about Noah releasing the raven, releasing the dove. You know, he released the raven and the dove, then released the, a week later the dove, and then a, another week later uh, the final time. So there was a three-week stretch of a seven-day period. And yes, I know the ninth of Av was on there, and I believe you're right. I believe Tammuz 17th was the first, and then uh, the the ninth day of Av culminated it, but I'll have to check and get back with you on that. My mind's not really calculating it right now, but I'll have to go look at it. I've got it somewhere in my articles that I'll have to go and uh, maybe confirm that on another video, but that's a very good point. Uh, uh, Sherry, thank you for sharing that. And yes, um, did God ever give instructions to not feast on a Shabbat? Yes, yeah, so that's what I was mentioning earlier. I'm not sure if you were on the on the uh, call, uh, Sherry, but that's what I uh, mentioned earlier, that even though Tammuz 17th fell on a Shabbat this year, in Zechariah 8, it doesn't say the fast of the fourth unless it's on the Shabbat, you know? So I agree with you, and um, I don't want to get into a, a huge debate with this because I know people have different opinions about it. And again, let the Holy Spirit lead you uh, with that opinion, you know, or that conviction that you may have. But I personally believe that you, you fast today on the 17th of Tammuz and not on the 18th of Tammuz because uh, like uh, Sherry said, 
if I'm pronouncing your name correctly. If I'm not, please I apologize. But um, like she said, uh, there's not anywhere that I know of in the Bible that uh, tells you, uh, okay, unless it's on a Shabbat, you, you, you don't fast, you know, so to speak. So uh, I do agree with you. Uh, yes, and uh, I'm going to confirm that. You've got me interested in going to my notes and seeing uh, when that was released, but it was in this period of the three weeks of sorrow. You know, uh, I know that um, the mountains were, uh, you could see the mountains on Tammuz 1. I do know that in the scriptures in Genesis 6 through 8, it does go through a timeline. And remember, that calendar is on the civil calendar because the biblical calendar was not instituted yet. The Exodus calendar where Moses' calendar, if you want to call it that, uh, Noah was on the Genesis calendar or the civil calendar where uh, Tammuz, uh, a lot of people look at it on the other, other calendar, which is incorrect, but on the civil calendar, you're, you're correct, Sherry, that uh, Tammuz 1 is when the mountains were seen, and then he gets into the dove, releasing of the raven, releasing of the dove. After that, I just I just have to review that real quick. Uh, I can't recall it off the top of my head. Uh, Isaiah 22, uh, Elohim replaces Shebna, okay, in the church. Yes, the Zechariah, Zechariah is one of my favorite books. I believe Zechariah, Sally is basically all prophetic. You know, I know Zechariah 1, people can look at it as ancient times, but I can make the case that Zechariah 1 is happening right now. And I've actually done a video with that. It goes back to the previous president, you know, President Trump. And I believe it started then uh, going forward with Zechariah 1. And you can really make that case now when you look at the world and look at the celestial bodies that happened during that time, what I'm talking about. I did a video on it, but I, I do believe that uh, the whole book of Zechariah is prophetic. And it will, even though it happened in history, it will come back and happen again prophetically in the future. Okay. Uh, uh, truck girl, I used to work at Babies R Us and met two Jews from the Holocaust, a married couple. They showed me the numbers on there. Oh man, it's pretty amazing. You know, when you ever, when you ever encounter some, uh, a Holocaust survivor, which uh, I'd never have, but I've heard people who have experienced that, it, it just really uh, tears your heart. You know, it really shambles your heart into pieces. How someone... <clears throat> how uh, people could be so evil and to want to get rid of any race, including the Jew Jewish people, is any race. You know, we love all of mankind, you know, but for anyone to hate uh, a race um, so much to eliminate them, to have genocide is totally, it's, it's just heartbreaking, you know, to say the least. So that's an experience that um, I wish I could experience because I've never met a Holocaust survivor, uh, but I, I definitely would like to do that, to experience that from, from what I hear uh, it is really uh, an amazing experience and a heartfelt experience to uh, understand that. Yeah, sure. You have me interested in looking at this now with the, uh, with the Noah story because I had it. Um, I'm writing a book actually called The Cross to the Crown. And uh, some of this is in the book that I'm writing is uh, the Noah story. And I just can't remember off the top of my head. I know the 9th of Av is on one of those dates. I just don't know if Tammuz 17th is. And it definitely could be. You know, I definitely could be wrong. So it's something that uh, I'm really intrigued to go and go studying and uh, reviewing Does anyone else have any comments or any um, suggestions or anything, uh, any prayers? You know, we, we take those as well. Uh, if you need any prayer or anything, uh, like I said, it's an open uh, chat, you know, for everything. And I've really enjoyed doing this. You know, I used to do a lot of green screens and um, I'm going to get back to that. But I've, I'm in this big transition with uh, moving and working and things like that, and writing a book and doing some music as well. So it's really been pretty busy, but uh, I'm gonna get back to the green screens uh, as well, but I've really enjoyed uh, fellowshipping with everybody on these live uh, videos, going through these uh, important topics and getting suggestions, getting corrections, getting edifying, uh, getting whatever it may be through you guys. Uh, I really appreciate uh, you guys joining us, you know, in a having an open conversation, you know, and really that's what it's about as a body of believers of coming together as one 
Echad, one new body, one new man, Jew and Gentile together. There's not two ways to worship. There's only one. And we need to uh, come together to understand that. And I really appreciate everybody uh, with their knowledge and their wisdom and uh, suggestions and whatever it may be, you know, corrections, edifying, you know, it's really amazing uh, to be a part of that. So I've really enjoyed that. And I just want to thank you guys for uh, joining us every time uh, that we do these videos. We normally get about 35 to 40 people that really are tuned in and um, that's beautiful. Or whether it's five people, it's, it's all the same to me, you know, and one person uh, will fellowship as well. So I really appreciate everybody joining, <clears throat> joining us on these <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, uh, on these live videos. And um, it's been a blessing to uh, be with you guys. Okay, so, yeah, that's great, truck girl. What a great experience. What a wonderful experience. Blessings to you, Olga, as you go to Kenya. I've got actually a, a very good friend of mine, a pastor over in Kenya uh, that I speak to regularly. So I uh, wish you the best. Godspeed, protection, blessings, favor. You know, I know it's going to be a great experience for you over there. So I wish you all the best. And uh, what a great, what a great blessing to go over there and spread the gospel and uh, a missionary trip. Uh, beautiful thing. But uh, yeah, so with that being said, I want to remind everybody that uh, I am, you know, like I mentioned before, writing a book called The Cross to the Crown. I'm going to do a live video on that and go through basically um, the chapters and go through the overview of the book. I've written two other books uh, that were prophetic books on the book of Daniel and also on the book of Jeremiah. But this book has a different tone to it. It's more of a, it's a devotional book, but it's also an information book on being set apart, on being, on understanding that we're all part of the kingdom of Israel, the commonwealth of Israel, that there's only one way to worship and to really bring out some of these great uh, feast day, the feast days, the divine appointments of the Lord, also Hanukkah, Purim, also all of these things, the Hebrew letters, the tribes, all of these beautiful things that the Lord has put in his Holy Bible for us to understand. I hope, I am hopeful to be finished with it uh, basically at the end of August, you know, and then it'll give us about 30 days to really get it out, you know, whoever wants to join us on this year journey because that's what it is. It's going to be a year journey from the Feast of Trumpets to the Feast of Trumpets. Uh, it will start on September 25th. Uh, I'll be doing live videos uh, every week on the, the the devotion and also the information in the book. So I hope that uh, you join us on that. It'll be a free book, okay? It'll be free, free ebook, whatever it may be. And it will be a journey of purification, of cleansing, you know, of going, getting intimate and drawing close to the Lord on the things that he has ordained that sometimes we neglect uh, as a church with the divine appointments, with the Sabbaths, with the new moons, also with uh, the devotion through the Hebrew letters. You know, that's the devotions will be through uh, the 22 Hebrew letters plus the final forms and the great revelation it will be of uh, purifying it. Uh, I've been personally, it comes from a personal journey that I personally have been on the last three or four years in the transition of about three or four th major things in my life. And I know how much I have received uh, with purification, with cleansing, and being more intimate uh, with the Lord, with, with the things that he has ordained. And uh, that's the thing is sometimes when we go through the transition, we kind of look at it from, okay, I've got, you know, my purification. And really, if we take the focus off of ourselves and start praying into the Lord and diving into the Lord on his things, it's just a little paradigm shift. Then we receive that breakthrough, so to speak. So it's really a uh, a book that goes through a lot of information. Uh, stay, stay tuned to it, and I'd love for you guys to go through the journey with us. Like I said, it's going to be a year journey. I know that's a lot, but I'm willing to do that. Uh, you know, these live videos uh, every week for a year and really go through all this, and I think we'll, we'll really get a lot of great inspiration, cleansing, purification, and draw closer than ever uh, to the Lord. Now, of course, you can do it many other ways as well, but it's just what the Lord has shown me and, uh, and my family and my friends who have gone through this journey with us to really the last two or three years to really understand 
uh, what the Lord was trying to tell us or tell me. Um, I just want to share that with you guys, and, and hopefully it will um, uh, help uh, anyone else out there who needs breakthrough, who needs uh, redemption, restoration, whatever it may be. I hope that it is a catalyst for that. Um, let's see. Amen, uh, Marcia. Prayers for Olga, for Kenya, and also for your daughters as well uh, to receive salvation. Alexandria, Haley and Alexandria. We stand with you on that, Marcia. Good to see you, Matt. Let's catch up soon, man. Thank you. Amen, truck girl. Olga, yes, prayer for uh, Marcia's daughters. In Yeshua's name, absolutely. Yes, so Sherry, the author of the book, Eye to Eye, or Eye for Eye, is Bill Koenig, B-I-L-L, -L, and his last name is K-O-E-N-I-G, Koenig. And it is a book, I think he's updated the book and revised the book. If not, he has a website that goes, I think he keeps up with it uh, pretty much yearly, you know, if I'm not mistaken. But that book, regardless of if he, if he does or not, that book will give you great insight that we need to be praying for our leaders because it's just amazing. I mean, he gives like 60 examples, you know, throughout the years. I mean, that is, again, just like the Tamu 17th and the 9th of Av, that is pretty phenomenal, you know, uh, statistic-wise, and astronomical that uh, for uh, things to happen like that is pretty is pretty phenomenal. Yes, thank you, Matt, uh, for for spelling that out. I guess I could have done that too, but <laughs> thank you for doing that. Well, well, Sherry, probably my accent and uh, also the way that I pronounce words, you probably couldn't make it out uh, anyhow. So thank you, Matt, for uh, spelling that out. So thanks. Kel Cal, yes, uh, definitely be praying for you with that. It's so important to find a fellowship. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we have to find the right fellowships and there's so much false doctrine out there or replacement theology, uh, as I call it. And replacement theology, if, um, if you're not familiar with it, a lot of people know that as the church replacing Israel uh, in the promises, which, are, which is demonic, is satanic. It tells, basically, replacement theology says God is a liar because God's not gonna uh, fulfill the promises that he gave Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and David, okay, which is, heresy, which is an abomination, okay, is blasphemy, you know, so replacement theology on that with the church replacing Israel is just false doctrine, okay, we're all in the commonwealth of Israel, Jew and Gentile, Ephesians 2, Galatians 3, Romans 11, even with Jacob crossing his hands, you know, with uh, Manasseh and Ephraim, you know, it tells you that we're all grafted into the commonwealth of Israel, uh, so to speak, um, and replacement theology even goes further than that, to be honest with you. Uh, you know, a lot of people know that, but I would go even further in the replacing of God's festivals, replacing of his divine appointments, Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Shavuot, trumpets, Yom Kippur and tabernacles, and also the Sabbath. You know, people celebrate the Sabbath on Sunday instead of Saturday, you know, according to Constantine, instead of God's Sabbath. So it's replacement theology, not only with the overall understanding of the church in Israel, but also with replacing God's holy days and God's divine appointments. And that's some of the things that I get into in the book as well, is we have to understand that there's one way to worship for both Jew and Gentile, and he has ordained that in the Holy Bible and mankind uh, traditions is what most of the quote unquote church has inherited and most people are ignorant to this okay so it's not really about the people it's really about the hierarchy of uh, Catholicism or the hierarchy of the American church with 
the Southern Baptist Convention, whoever you want to talk about. Um, that's really the problem that I have is the leadership of the church will not, uh, uh, will not admit or will not come out to understand that we are replacing God's festivals according to mankind or according to your own tradition. You know, it's the same thing. It's self-idolatry or idolatry of the church instead of following God's uh, festivals. Uh, you're exactly right, Sherry. So yeah, exactly. And again, um, everybody can go on their own convictions and ask the Holy Spirit to lead them. But in my opinion, I've never found a scripture that says on a fast day like to move 17th or the 9th of Av or the 10th month or the 7th month, that if it falls on the Sabbath, that you shouldn't fast on that day. So um, again, uh, I totally agree with you, uh, Sherry. That's my personal opinion. Today was a fast day, not tomorrow. Uh, and then obviously on the ninth day of Av, whether it's a Sabbath or not, in my honest opinion, uh, it is a, a fast day as well. So I agree with you on that. Shuri, okay, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. So I always uh, am very shy when it comes to trying to pronounce people's names because, uh, you know, sometimes it's hard to pronounce them. So thank you, it's Shuri. That's a pretty cool name, Shuri. So thank you for uh, clarifying that. And Sherry, if you found the Feast Observing Church, then maybe, um, maybe you can talk to the leadership about the scriptures of the Sabbath and have a good conversation with the leadership. And maybe since they are on the festivals, kind of correlate it to, well, you're celebrating the feast days instead of man's traditions, then why are you observing man's Sabbath instead of God's Sabbath? So uh, that would be a good uh, opening to kind of uh, get them to worship on uh, the true Sabbath. Uh, truck girl, uh, yes, um, it's not wrong to worship and study yourself or with a, a small fellowship. It does say in the Bible that, that he does want us to congregate, but um, there's nothing wrong with that as well. Honestly, I don't have a church that I attend regularly. Uh, I can be honest with everybody. Uh, I, am, I have moved, you know, from another state uh, recently, but I haven't found a church yet that uh, I want to attend, but I do want to find fellowship with a community of believers who believe, excuse me, in the word of God, in the true word of God and uphold the Sabbath, upholds the feast days and all these beautiful things that we're talking about. So I'm with you. It is hard to find a church that observes the Holy Bible in full, you know, uh, with Sabbath, with feast days, etc. maybe some messianic con uh, congregations, but uh, it's always good to fellowship with believers. You know, just like I said, I've enjoyed fellowshipping with you guys instead of just a green screen and a camera. You know, I've enjoyed, you know, conversating with you guys over uh, the internet, uh, so to speak, and uh, live videos, etc. But it's always good to fellowship with uh, other believers as well. So I hope you do find a good church. Uh, Shuri, you know, again, I'm not saying that I'm right on the Raven date. I'm not sure. I do know the 9th of Av is in there, but uh, as far as Tammuz 17th, it could go back to Tammuz 17th, like you said, with the Raven and then the Dove and then, the, you know, because it's the three weeks. So uh, you could be exactly right. And uh, I just need to go look at it. And um, yeah, I'm sure you will as well go study it uh, out. So I'm not saying that you have it wrong at all because I'm not sure, um, you know, what the dates are with the three is three uh, three weeks, you know, that uh, that happened, as we all know. So it definitely could be the three weeks of sorrow, like you've mentioned. Okay, so yeah, this is a good um, comment by Shuri as well. Have wondered what date Satan was thrown out of heaven, banished to earth. Well, in my opinion, if we look at Revelation 12, it's the three and a half year mark, you know, of the tribulation, which will be Passover is when, you know, he does it. So think about it. He's thrown out three and a half years, okay, onto earth 
of the seven year tribulation, the midpoint he's thrown out, which is Passover. So if the, if the tribulation, be, if, if the tribulation begins on, if the, uh, if the tribulation begins on the seven years, on the Feast of Trumpets, to the Feast of Trumpets, then midway point of the tribulation is Passover. You know, so we have to understand Satan is thrown out of, on Passover, well, that's when the Antichrist desecrates the temple. That's when the witnesses are resurrected, uh, so to speak. Um, excuse me for one moment. I've, one moment, please. I'm sorry. One second. Sorry, guys. I had somebody knocking at my door, so sorry about that. Uh, but anyhow, where were we? So yes, the Feast of Trumpets will begin on the uh, will begin the seven year tribulation period, and then three and a half year mark will put you at Passover. So that's when I believe literally that he will be thrown out. Is Revelation twelve is the midpoint, and then that's when Satan's incarnated uh, fully by uh, or Antichrist is incarnated fully by Satan. He desecrates the temple, abominates it, Matthew 24 and Daniel as well. And then we have the last three and a half years. So that's my personal understanding of it, Shuri. So uh, it goes with the feast days. Again, that's why it's important to understand the, the divine appointments of the Lord because these events that will happen uh, in the future, especially at the end of the age uh, when Messiah returns or the last seven years or whatever it may be, we're gonna see events happen on these feast days also on the ninth day of Av, also on Tammuz 17th. History will repeat itself, and that's why Zechariah, goes back to Zechariah 8, that's why Zechariah wrote that these are fast days on the fourth of the month, the fifth of the month, the seventh and the tenth, and we can expect these events to happen just like on the feast days of the Lord, we will see events happen um, on those feast days. It's gonna be cyclical, it's gonna happen again, and that's why we, pretty much focus on these things on a lot of videos, God's calendar, the divine appointments of the Lord, the everlasting covenants, those three basic foundation principles. If we understand God's calendar, the divine appointments of the Lord, and the everlasting covenants, the Bible is gonna read very smooth and cohesive, consistent. And when we get to the book of Revelation, we're going to understand these things because it goes into the understanding of the Torah and the divine appointments and all of these things that we find in the Torah, John's confirming those things as well. Okay, John, I'll stop going to worship. Uh, Stacy, uh, shalom to you, uh, Stacy. Uh, I need prayer. I have been a hard time staying asleep at night. Some people think it's because of lack of faith in Yahweh. I would disagree with the lack of faith in Yahweh. It's probably for some other things, you know, that might be going on, but we will definitely be praying for you and hopefully everyone on this call uh, will heed that prayer as well for you, Stacy. And thank you for joining us. And, and uh, we pray that you have sweet sleep. And I would read the scriptures if I could, you know, encourage you to read the scriptures of having sweet sleep, you know, off the top of my head, I can't think of them. Okay. Cause I'm in this subject of what we're speaking of now, but, um, you know, there's scriptures that really meditate on those. I'm a big believer in using the word of God, you know, and speaking it out, you know, two or three witnesses will establish a matter and to pray into that in your personal life. Uh, if it's lack of sleep, find two or three scriptures and pray into it with the Lord and speak it out to the Lord. Again, I go through this in the book that I'm writing as well. The power of speaking the word of God out, you know, is totally amazing. Uh, so what did Messiah do when he was tempted? You know, the only thing he said was, it is written, it is written, it is written. So if you go in there and it is written and establish your prayers, with two or three scriptures, and it says establishes the matter in the courts of heaven, I believe you will receive uh, some sweet sleep, hopefully. So I hope that helps. You know, find two or three scriptures, um, pray into those, speak them out loud, and stand on those promises, and it, hopefully it manifests uh, to where you're having good sleep at night.
And that is a very good point, Cherie. Uh, he definitely did say that, to not mingle with uh, the non-believers. Let's see. I'm sorry, my internet, it, it kind of loses my spot every time I, I go up and down, so I have to find where I left off. Yeah, we all have to be very wise. I know there's some comments being made right now with you know what uh, finding a church and stuff. We've got to be wise, wise with that. What do you say? Be wise as serpents, gentle as doves. You know, we've got to be wise with everything, and that includes not being deceived. Um, I had a a woman contact me the other day asking if I wanted to pray with her and for breakthrough and deliverance and things like that. And she was telling me her story, and she got involved in a church, and it just has put her in bondage in so many ways uh, that it's unbelievable. So we have to really understand we can't, uh, we can't congregate with just anyone, you know, because we will be open to things that will really put us in bondage, uh, so to speak. And uh, just like, um, unfortunately, she was put in as well. Uh, Reba, how you doing? Shalom to you. My personal belief uh, on if the rapture is going to be on the Feast of Trumpets this year is no. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, I believe there's a lot of things in the Holy Bible that still has to come to fruition, uh, so to speak. And the main thing that I see that has not occurred yet is the transition of power uh, between the kingdoms in the book of Daniel. Uh, the book of Daniel is an end of the age book. You know, it says that close the book, seal the book until the end. He told Daniel to do that. So I believe his entire book of visions and dreams now, not the historical events, but the visions and dreams that Daniel has had or Nebuchadnezzar had, I believe are for the end of the age. Just like he says, he told Nebuchadnezzar, this is for the latter days. Okay, this is for the end of the age, so to speak. So, and if you read Daniel 8, this is for the end of the age, the latter days. So what do I mean by that is there's four kingdoms that will rise to power before Messiah returns for a second coming, according to the book of Daniel. And I'm going to just give you a synopsis of in my opinion. The first one is uh, Babylon, which is Iraq today. The second one is Persia, which is Iran. The third one is you, in your Bible, it's Greece, but it's really Yavon, which is Turkey. And then the fourth one will be a conglomerate of those three nations. In Revelation 13, John says, I saw one beast, and it was a lion, a bear, and a leopard. Well, he's reverting you back to Daniel 7 because that's the first three beasts or three kingdoms of Daniel 7, a lion, a bear, and a leopard. But then the fourth beast in Daniel 7, which is the beast that John's talking about is the Antichrist kingdom, is made up of a lion, a bear, and a leopard. The fourth kingdom is made up of the other three kingdoms, meaning the conglomerate land area of that area, Iraq, Iran, Turkey, uh, North Africa, you'll see that in there as well. That will be the beast kingdom. He says there's only three kingdoms that the Antichrist kingdom is made of, the conglomerate, and that is Babylon, Persia, and Yavon, which again encompasses the Middle East and the North Africa countries of Egypt, Sudan, and Libya. So we have to understand that those have to come to fruition before Messiah returns. And right now, I think anyone who keeps up with the geopolitical uh, stuff over there in the Middle East and North Africa will agree that Iran is the dominant superpower of the Middle East. I don't think there's any political or religious or whoever leader out there that won't agree that Iran is the dominant. Well, look what happened before Iran. Iraq fell, Saddam Hussein. So again, it's the unique things about the prophets is historically they were prophesying through the events of their day and ultimately to the prophetic, if that makes sense. History will repeat itself is what I'm saying. So just like Babylon, Persia, and Greece uh, happened before, Babylon, Persia, and Greece is Turkey because that's where it is. Yavon will happen again, okay? And we have to understand that. So right now we're in the Iran kingdom or Medo-Persia kingdom, and you're seeing Turkey or Yavon really challenging that. And I believe in these next seven years, you're gonna see Turkey, Yavon, really become the dominant superpower of the Middle East. And when that happens, 
Daniel 8 tells you there's only a couple events that happens before Messiah, okay? Turkey will become great. It will divide into four kings of the 10, and then a leader will rise out of that four, and that will be the Antichrist, okay? So I'm gonna do some videos on the book of Daniel here in the future, but that's just a synopsis. I don't believe the rapture will occur this Feast of Trumpets because of what I just mentioned. We still have these kingdoms to come into fruition. Turkey's gotta be the main dog, okay? The superpower, if you will, over there, because that is what Ezekiel 38 is talking about, is Turkey, okay, the land of Magog, Tagorma, Gomer, all of these areas, that is, all of them are in the nation of Turkey. When you look at any ancient biblical atlas, it's gonna show you that all of those countries in Ezekiel 38 or names, Magog, Tagorma, Gomer, etc., they're gonna be in the land of Turkey, not Russia, not any of that. And by the way, Russia's having enough hard time over in Ukraine right now. They're not going to march towards Jerusalem, okay? So Russia's not Ezekiel 38. Russia's not Gog, not Magog. It's Turkey. And you're going to see Turkey really stamp, uh, stamp their mark in the next seven years. And then I believe personally, and I don't think I've ever said this on video, but I'll give you my personal opinion, okay? And this is my personal opinion that I believe we have 14 years. We have a seven to all these events are gonna to come to fruition, which like I said, he's gonna tee it up for the Antichrist. And then I believe personally, the, the seven year tribulation will begin um, the next Shemitah cycle, okay? Cause the Shemitah cycle is a block of seven. What does that mean? That means that if the rapture or the tribulation does not occur in the Feast of Trumpets this year, that it cannot occur until seven more years. It can occur in 2025, 2026. It's a block of seven. You can't divide the block of seven. So that's what I'm saying. So that's personally where I'm coming from. And again, God knows best. You know, I'm just trying to understand myself, but I believe that the tribulation will not start uh, this Feast of Trumpets. I believe it will be uh, seven years from this year. But like I said, God knows best and I'll be ready on the Feast of Trumpets no matter what. If it's this year or next year or seven years, I'll be uh, ready to be with the Lord. Okay, Kel Cal, uh, you've mentioned a great point. Um, this is very debatable. And it really drives me nuts. Um, if you are saved in Yeshua, when you accept him as your savior, you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. You know, and I know people that um, speak in tongues say that if you don't uh, speak in tongues and you don't have the Holy Spirit, that is nonsense. There's no scriptural evidence of that. You know, that is absolute nonsense. If you believe in Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah, he is your personal savior, you are indwelt with the Holy Spirit. And those people need to go read 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. Not everybody will speak in tongues. Paul makes that very clear that not everybody will speak in tongues. Not everybody will be given a gift of prophecy. Not everybody will be given. The gifts are for the Holy Spirit to divide on whoever he wants to have those. Okay, so I hope that uh, makes sense uh, to you. And don't get discouraged, Kel Cal, when people come across you like that because the scriptures will... Uh, confirm and you can stand on those with people is read 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 because uh, everybody doesn't speak in tongues. I mean, I don't speak in tongues either, you know, just to be honest with you. You know, I have other gifts, but uh, my gifts uh, right now, unless the Lord gives me a gift of tongues, I don't have the gift of tongues at the moment. So, um, and I know plenty of people who are also men and women of God who do not speak in tongues as well. So that is um, nonsense and it is a big topic in the church. And I think it's a topic that people really need to just read the scriptures and understand that not everyone is gonna speak in tongues. And Paul even makes it clear that he does wish everybody would speak in tongues, but he would rather people um, be in order and so people can understand then speaking in tongues. So. Uh, people, people really need to understand what Paul is saying there and not get on their high horse, so to speak, and saying, well, I speak in tongues, and if you don't have that, then, you know, or my prayer language or whatever people call it, and if you don't have that, then you don't really have the Holy Spirit. That is total nonsense, in my opinion, and um, that's just my personal opinion. 
But yes, please send me an email as well if you want to, Kelcal, uh, chat at faithfulperformance.com. And again, I lost my place, so I apologize again. Okay, I got, all right. Yeah, well, thank you for joining us, Shuri. Uh, I enjoy doing the videos and really, like I said, congregating with, with everybody and really getting inside and you guys are edifying me and really uh, encouraging me to go back and really uh, go over some of these things that we're talking about. Okay, yeah, Kel Cal gave us an answer, and uh, she definitely could be right on Tammuz 10th, 17th, and then on the 24th. Great point, Matt. That's exactly right, man. He abominates the, the Antichrist, abominates the temple on Passover, Abomination of Desolation that Messiah mentioned that really is the marker for the three and a half years uh, left on the earth where Antichrist will really have uh, his way until Messiah returns. So yeah, that's an awesome point, Matt. Shuri, that's exactly correct. Yeah, uh, God's calendar, I mean, that's one of the main things that we speak about because I know what it's done for me personally to understand his timeline and his calendar and the events that he has on his calendar and how important it is to him. And uh, again, the calendar that we have is just a replacement of his, okay? So it's replacement theology. And I say that very lightly because we all have to live on the Gregorian calendar for work and school and all these things. But uh, it is a replacement of God's calendar uh, that uh, the church has adopted the Gregorian calendar, which the church should be on the biblical calendar as well as what we have to do on the Gregorian calendar with work or whatever it may be. Uh, there you go. Denise mentioned a good Psalms uh, for sleep. Uh, there is uh, Psalms 3, 5. And I think I'm going to meditate on that as well. So thank you for sharing that, Denise. Yeah, Kelly mentions a good point as well. Um, you know, how it used to begin, you know, you think about with Messiah, you know, and with the disciples uh, and all of the, uh, you know, the apostles, you know, and the believers, they congregated. Yes, they went to synagogue on Shabbat, you know, just like Paul did, just like Messiah did, but they also congregated in their homes as well. So there's nothing wrong with having Bible studies or congregating in your home, uh, there's nothing wrong with that as all as well, but uh, obviously, you know, if we could find a synagogue, a messianic synagogue, or whatever, that would be pretty cool as well to uh, fellowship uh, in in that way. Uh, we have a, a prayer request, and I'm not going to try to pronounce the name uh, to, you know, but, uh, uh, but we have a, a prayer request, uh, and I'll say from Ben, okay, and I'm not going to try to pronounce the rest of the name out of respect. So Ben, uh, good evening, please pray for me and foster child to be able to move into our own home soon, trying to finish a one room from 2019. And yes, our prayers are with you, uh, with you and your foster child you know, for that room to be completed, please send me an email. If you're still online, please send me an email at chat at faithfulperformance.com. I would like to speak more about this with you, please. So just uh, please send me an email at chat at faithfulperformance.com. Um, and I would really appreciate that.
So what date Adam fell, if I'm understanding you correctly, what date Adam fell, um, he was born or he was made or created on the Feast of Trumpets. You know, so he was created on the sixth day, which would be the Feast of Trumpets. So that means the world began on Elul 25. So if you back up Elul 25, Tishri 1 was the first day of creation. And that's, or I'm sorry, the sixth day of creation. And that's when Adam was um, created. So I don't know if that's what you're speaking of when Adam fell or if it was when they sinned or whatever, but he was created on uh, the Feast of Trumpets on the sixth day. Yeah, yeah, Kelly. So yeah, Turkey is is the is the main superpower you have to keep up with. That's where Ezekiel thirty eight comes into play. All the kingdoms of Daniel ends with that. Uh, they will be the the main headquarters, so to speak. The king of the north is Turkey. You know, it's not Russia. It's Turkey. You know, it's Islamic. And I have to tell people, you know, when we look at eschatology, when we look at the prophecies, we have to remember what is the battle about. You know, who has the problem with the covenants, who have a problem with the Temple Mount, who has a problem with the Jewish people. Um, you know, no matter what people say, Europe does not. Okay, the Romans, I know they destroyed the Temple, you know, in AD 70, but currently up today, who has the problem with the Jewish people and with the Temple Mount? Does Europe, does the Romans, does the Italians? Of course not, they don't, they don't care. Okay, does Russia have a problem with it? They don't care. Okay, who has the problem with those things? Islam, Esau, Ishmael, the Islamist, you know, um, that's the bottom line. It's the covenants, you know, it's the deed to the land. It's about real estate, you know, and that's who has the problem with it is the Muslims, okay, the Islam. Okay, I don't want to say Muslim, I want to say Islam, you know, is the problem that we have. That's the battle at the end of the age. In fact, when you look at the Bible, uh, Rome's mentioned probably about 15 or 16 times, and not one time is it in destruction, okay? So you would think the prophets would uh, clarify who Messiah does come against, and guess what? He, they do. And every country that Messiah literally, literally comes to fight against at his second coming, they're all radical Islamist countries, okay? Period. You know, that's that's the Bible speaking to us. So we got to get our eschatology correct, our prophet prophecies understanding, our geography right. The prophets would have understood the table of nations very clearly when they were writing the prophecies, okay? So this is not a, a Russia thing. This is not a Roman thing. This is a Judeo-Christian, however you want to call it, Jewish people versus the Commonwealth of Israel versus the Islam. That's what the whole war, uh, war will be about at the second coming. When you look at the state of Israel right now, they are surrounded by people who want to take them off the map, okay? Rome doesn't care. Russia doesn't care. Okay, Europe doesn't care. China doesn't care, okay? It's about the Islamist versus, it's about the covenants, the deed to the lamb. Uh, D to the land, not the lamb. A D to, the, well, to the lamb, but to the land. And it, what is that? That's Esau versus Jacob, Ishmael versus Isaac, okay? And that's what the battle is about. It's about Islam and the D to the land. So yes, Turkey is the main dog and the president over there, if you do your research on him, President Erdogan, you know, over the last 20 years, he has definitely trans, uh, transitioned Turkey from a republic to wanting to become the uh, the tyrannical uh, revived Ottoman Empire. And, and if you keep up with it, I know everyone's attention has been on everywhere other than that with the war in Russia and Ukraine and everybody thinks that Russia is going to march right on in through Europe to Jerusalem. That is nonsense. That will not happen. That will not happen. Russia just wants to get their land back of what they previously had with the Soviet Union and that did not include Israel, okay? So that will not happen. They're trying to get their land back, and that is all. I'm not saying I agree with it. I don't agree with it at all, but that's what their mindset is. And uh, so they're not Gog of Magog. They're not any of that. It's, it's, it's about Turkey. So we all need to be paying attention to uh, Turkey and what the president, Erdogan, has done going into Iraq, going into Syria, Libya, uh, relations with Sudan, uh, 
Afghanistan, you name it. They're the ones who are spreading to try to become the superpower of the Middle East, just like the prophet Daniel, just like the prophet Daniel uh, has uh, prophesied in his kingdoms, so to speak. So yes, Turkey is the main dog. Okay, let's see. Yes, okay. Matt, that's exactly right. I know we're in alignment with that from our conversations in the past, Matt. Uh, yes, Turkey is definitely uh, the big dog, as I call it, the varsity team uh, that we need to be looking at over there. Yes, Cherie, that is exactly correct. When you look at the political moves over there and what they're doing with the countries I just mentioned, with the invasion of those countries, they're trying to revive the Ottoman Empire with Iraq, with Syria, with the Balkans, with the, all of these areas, North Africa. They're trying to reestablish the ancient Ottoman Empire, and I believe that God will give them that authority to do that because that's what he prophesied through his prophets, that Turkey will become that dominant superpower. Amen, Kelly. I totally agree with that. Okay, okay. Uh, I enjoy uh, this fellowship as well, and I hope everybody on here as well. You know, just the trading of ideas and uh, understanding and wisdom and in a very respectful way, that's what it's really about. So often, you know, you get on these chat rooms or I, I don't personally, but I've seen it and I've heard about it where believers are just attacking each other. Oh, you believe in a pre-trib, always post um, You know, at the end of the day, we're all trying to figure out what the Lord's trying to tell us and we should be one a, one a cod. So whether it's pre-trib, post-trib, or if this guy's the antichrist, or if that's the beast kingdom or Rome or Turkey or whatever, we're all trying to understand these things and talk about them in a respectful way. So that's, uh, I really appreciate that. And, um, and I enjoy this as well. And I enjoy everybody on here being that respectful towards one another, whether we agree or whether we disagree. We have one thing we can agree on that we love Yeshua and uh, we love the blessed Holy Spirit and the Father, you know, and we're all trying to do his will and trying to understand uh, what he's trying to tell us. Yes, uh, I love Pastor Biltz, uh, Shuri. Uh, he's, he's been a, a good influence, I believe, hopefully for a lot of people. I know he has for me as well with some of the revelation that God's given him with the blood moons, uh, especially the blood moons and a lot of the things with the divine appointments of the Lord. He's a big uh, sponsor of that as well with the feast days of the Lord, the new moon. Uh, he does a phenomenal job and um, I really enjoy, I listen to him as well whenever I get a chance to and um, he's, a, he's a remarkable man. I really like uh, Pastor Biltz. Uh, sure, yes, Damascus will be leveled. I believe that will happen uh, during the tribulation period. Isaiah, what is it, 17? Uh, that will happen. If you look at it, a lot of people, you know, um, irresponsibly will say, yeah, Damascus is going to be destroyed, you know, anytime. Well, it's kind of irresponsible because if Damascus is going to be destroyed, Israel, northern Israel is going to be a part of that if you read the prophecy. So when people are calling for the destruction for whatever reason of Damascus, we got to be very careful. Number one, they're human beings that live in Damascus and whether they're believers or not, we need to be praying for the believers. Number two, if someone is that way, they need to understand that the Jewish people will be in that category as well in Northern Israel because the prophecy states that. So we have to be very careful, but I believe that those prophecies, Damascus to be wiped out, I think that's only one time that that could happen. And I believe that will be on the seven year tribulation period. Sometime during that time or at Messiah's second coming, when you're talking about wiping out a city that has one of the oldest cities in the world is Damascus. I think we have to be responsible enough to understand that that can only happen in my opinion uh, in, in today's world at during the tribulation period where a lot of things are gonna be destroyed, including uh, Damascus and the Lord will have his way with the entire globe, not just with Damascus or Israel, with all of it, he's gonna have his way.
Yep, and Matt's exactly correct. Uh, exactly correct. Uh, the old Old Testament prophets. All we have to do is translate it into today's countries, and those countries are, like Matt said, are all radical, fundamentalist Islamic nations. You know, so there's a issue with the deed of the land with those nations and with Israel. Uh, just like Matt said, it goes back into the table of nations as well. Uh, yes, this has been asked a lot of times, uh, Shuri, aren't we going into a Jubilee year this year? Um, I don't really know, to be honest with you. Um, I know that uh, I believe even Pastor Biltz, you know, uh, uh, believes that, that we're headed into a Jubilee year. Also, a lot of other people do as well. And if that's the case, then hallelujah. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, I can't personally confirm that. I know everybody just does the math of the division of the Jubilee number to the years, just like they do to Shemitah. You know, you're, you're in a Shemitah year if it's divisible by seven, right? So everybody knows that we're in a Shemitah year, but is this going to be the Jubilee year coming up? You know, we'll have to wait and see, you know, personally, but I hope so. That would be phenomenal if that was the case. You know, if we're uh, into a Jubilee year, which I believe most people would say that's when the Lord is coming That'll be the next thing. So uh, I'm not really sure, to be honest with you. I hope so, and uh, we, we'll see what happens. But um, I totally agree that um, it definitely could be because of the math. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, Cherie, um, yeah, I did a video, I think a week or so ago, that uh, about the Shemitah year and some of the statistics. I mean, you're seeing the stock market being, you know, killed right now. Inflation is the worst in four decades, you know, since Jimmy Carter, um, so the president, so to speak. Uh, you've got all of these things with real estate sky high, cars are sky high, inflation is sky high. I mean, we're ripe for a correction. So it's going to be interesting to see uh, when you look at uh, people who are behind in rent like 9 million people are behind in rent payments. Uh, credit cards are being maxed out. Uh, it's called the Shemitah is what it's called. I can tell people it's called the Shemitah year where everything's get, everything gets balanced out. You know, it's the Lord's release as he calls it in the Bible. And this is going to be a very interesting time. And for all of us to pray into this, every one of us needs to be praying into these next couple of months because the Shemitah cycle, if you uh, do the historical uh, understanding of it, is it gets really going in the springtime, which it did this year as well. And then over the summer, it starts to really show its teeth. And then as we all know who keeps up with it, come the month of Elul, the last month, especially that last day, Elul 29, when the Jewish people are canceling out debts to each other, you know, the Lord's release, like he commanded them, that's when everything really gets balanced out, just like it did in 2015, just like it did in 2008, 01, 94, 87, 80, 73, 66 uh, is factual. You know, this is not something that I'm making up. You know, this is factual stuff of what's going on, you know, um, with the Shemitah cycle. We really need to be praying into that, but you're exactly right that um, we are ripe for a correction. Okay, let's see. Yeah. Isaiah 17, if you really read that prophecy, it's really an amazing, I, I did a video a long time ago on that because um, I've been into the calendar and the feast days and the covenants and other things, but I'm gonna get back into the prophets here uh, into this new Shemitah cycle uh, once these other things are, are finished. Thank you, Kelly. Yes, uh, it's just important, you know, for all of us to come together to really explore uh, the true intent of the scriptures, you know, and that's the main thing is what's the true intent of the scriptures? The original intent of the scriptures is to warn the body of believers what's to come. You know, God didn't leave us in the dark. We just have to understand, like Matt says, the true intent of the nations. You know, who are these nations? And they might have ancient names, but we need to correlate them into today's Babylon, Iraq. Persia, Iran, Yavan, Turkey, or in your Bible, it says Greece. So a lot of this comes to trans, translations and the English translation does have fault in it. Of course it does. It's by man. Uh, translations are by man. So they do have fault or biased uh, uh, interpretation, so to speak. So Greece is a misinterpretation of that, of Daniel. You know, it's really Yavan, you know, which is Turkey. 
Again, all of those nations in Ezekiel 38, or not nations, but all of those names that are mentioned, Magog, Gomer, Tagorma, you know, all of these places are in Turkey with the ancient biblical maps. So it's so important. So uh, we have to understand what's the reason for the battle, who's in the battle, what does it matter to that specific country, and no doubt the problem or who has the problem with the Temple Mount, who has the problem with the Jewish people, who has the problem with Israel, is Islam. It's very clear. It's, the, it's a family affair, as I call it. If you really look at it, it's a family, it's a brother affair. You know, Ishmael versus Isaac, they were stepbrothers. Esau, Jacob, they were twins. And what did God tell them? You know, we know the story. The uh, younger will be the greater than the older one, you know, so to speak. Jacob will be greater than Esau. So we all know the scriptures and it's about real estate. It's about the deed to the land is all that it is. And it's a family affair. And if we can look at it like that, that would, they're, they're brothers. You know, the, the Muslims and, or the Arabs and the Jewish people are brothers, you know, when it comes to their kin. You know, and they had this kind of like a family does with when uh, their parents pass away. Who gets the right to all the estate, so to speak? So that's how we have to look at uh, this battle in a very simple matter. Is it's about the deed to the land of the Abrahamic covenant. Islam believes it's Ishmael. We obviously, because the Bible tells us, God says it's Isaac through Jacob and not Esau. You know, so it's so important to understand that. Okay, see? Sorry guys, trying to find my place again. Okay, yeah, okay, sure, yeah, sorry about that. I thought you mentioned when he was created. He was created on the Feast of Trumpets. I really don't have any idea of the date that he got kicked out. If anybody has that, I would love to know that, but yeah, I don't, I don't know when he was, he and Eve were kicked out of the garden. But I would imagine it to be on one of these important dates. Uh, that God has. Uh, Jake, shalom to you, man. Good to see you. What is the proper way to fast for a healthy adult? Biblically, what are we allowed to drink? Um, you know, it depends. Um, it's probably a question that's probably not for me to answer, you know, to be honest with you. But um, the way that I personally fast is um, I will just go like today. Uh, I've had very minimal water, but no food. You know, so I know some people do no food, no water. You know, I like to just tell people to let the Holy Spirit lead you, you know, uh, with fasting. Uh, I don't know if fasting is actually defined in the Holy Bible. Maybe someone can correct me or edify me on that. But I don't know if I've ever read, you know, this is what, this is how you fast. Uh, you know, obviously mourn, tear your, you know, we, we see all that in the scriptures. But uh, what is fasting? I think uh, each person person, I mean, you can listen to the sages and no food, no water, of course, uh, or you can go uh, pray to the Holy Spirit and he will certainly lead you into all things, including uh, in fasting. So I probably didn't answer your question, Jake, but uh, that's just uh, my personal opinion. It's probably outside of my, um, for me to answer that personally. Yeah, that's a great point, Cal Cal. You know, so often, you know, we're, we're very quick to, you know, hey, Damascus is going to be destroyed tomorrow. You know, I can see it with the Syrian war. It's going to be destroyed. And we have, that's just really kind of irresponsible uh, as believers in spreading the gospel, you know, because there's a lot of Muslims that are getting visions and dreams, you know, of the Lord, you know, so to speak. So uh, the longer he waits to come, the more we're able to get uh, the gospel to those people, you know, so to speak. And, and as long as things aren't getting blown up in Damascus or everywhere else, it gives those people an opportunity each day to receive the gospel and to receive the Lord for salvation. You know, we're talking about eternal life or eternal damnation is what we're talking about. So we can't go on our emotions of, you know, whether we're 
we don't like the Muslim people, or we don't like Islam or whatever, that we just want them destroyed. Let's let the Lord deal with that. You know, our job is to spread the gospel and be a part of the Great Commission and to love our neighbor. And the Muslim people are our neighbors, you know, uh, the Arabs and all of mankind is, all, is our neighbors. All tribes, tongues, nations, everybody who believes in the Lord will be saved. So that's my standpoint on uh, those things. So that's a great point, Kel Cal, about that is we need to remember uh, that not only believers live there, but also there's an opportunity for people to come to salvation every day. Uh, and there wouldn't be if Damascus was destroyed right now. So uh, we have to be very responsible with that. That's a very good way to put it, Cherie. You know, I agree with that. That's a very good way to put it when Adam ate the forbidden fruit. He basically handed over the deed to the earth to uh, to Satan, and uh, so yeah, I can't. Uh, yeah, I totally agree with that. Actually, that's a very good point. Shalom, David. Good to see you, man. Shabbat shalom to you for another thirty minutes on the East Coast. But um, Shabbat shalom to you, man. Good to see you again. we got some folks on here that I've known for some time now with Matt and uh, also with David. Uh, the, I've known these guys for, for several years now, so it's good to see these guys. Oh, man. If you have any revelation, David, uh, with uh, praying in, in the spirit and all that today with the move 17th, please go ahead, man, and uh, share it or anybody else for that matter. That's an interesting point, uh, Sheree, about uh, the Catholic Church and Islam. Uh, I'll leave it at that uh, for this video. Yeah, Sheree, you know, everybody's been paying attention to Ukraine and Russia, uh, politics in America, um, you know, all of these things with what we're doing with Roe versus Wade, not which, which we should, COVID, which we should. But in the midst of this, no one's paying attention, like you're saying, to what Erdogan's doing. So I would encourage everybody to really pay attention to what's going on uh, in the Middle East. Uh, as we know, deception is going to reign at the end of the age. You know, deception will. So we have to understand that the devil might want you to look at this while he's doing that. And I believe uh, that's going to be coming. It's going on right now, and it's going to be coming soon to where people aren't going to understand uh, the time of their visitation uh, just like Messiah said to the Jewish people on Luke 19, 41 through 44, that they didn't understand the time of their visitation. And that's why he warned all of us to not be caught as a thief in the night, to be wise, not foolish, to be a good servant, not an evil servant, because of deception will reign at the end of the age. And we all have to be very, very careful, you know, uh, with everything, you know, so to speak. So... Wow, it's pretty amazing, David. Seven times seven, 70 times, yep. Yep, yep, a lot of people are calling for the Jubilee year this year, David. You know, we've mentioned that before, you know, uh, earlier on the video that um, a lot believe that it is ju Jubilee year. I can't deny that and I hope it is and I agree, uh, but I can't uh, obviously confirm that, you know, uh, with that. I know Pastor Mark Biltz and many others are saying that, which, you know, I have a lot of respect for him and admire him and really uh, watch some of his teachings as well. So um, I can't deny that it is the Jubilee year and may it be, because I think it'd be a double Shemitah year is what that really is, it is a double Shemitah on the 50th year. <laughs> That's right, Matt. Yeah, so anybody, I don't see a Catholic church sitting on the uh, Temple Mount. You know, I don't see a Baptist church sitting on the Temple Mount as well. <laughs> Uh, what we do see is a big Dome of the Rock in the al Aska Mosque, which is Islam. Uh, the biggest abomination on earth is sitting on the most holiest place on earth, which is the Temple Mount. So that that is a great point, man. And if we can just understand that basic point, that the holiest piece of land on the face of the earth, the Temple Mount, 
is desecrated right now, the time of the Gentiles, okay, until Messiah returns. That's uh, That really substantiates the fact that it's an Islam thing, not a Roman Catholic thing or Italian or European Antichrist or whatever that may be. Amen. Correction. Oh, no, Shuri, I wasn't trying to uh, uh, point anything towards you or anybody else. I was just saying in general, you know, I've heard over the Internet and just people in general and some of them aren't even believers, you know. So, yeah, I definitely wasn't pointing the finger at you or anyone else. So, yeah, no worries. I know what you were talking about. The prophecy of Isaiah 17 coming to fruition is what you were talking about. So, yeah, I know you weren't calling for any anything like that, you know, so. But uh, unfortunately, you know, some people, uh, even believers, you know, they were calling for that, especially back when the uh, Syrian civil war started, you know, they were calling for that. So yeah, if I uh, don't, please don't take me out of context. I definitely wasn't uh, speaking to you about that. It was just overall what I heard back seven, eight years ago when the uh, civil, uh, Syria civil war uh, began. So just to clarify for you. And yes, it will all be fulfilled, just like you just mentioned, you know. Yeah, Kilkow, basically Adam was on the civil calendar. Uh, or the Genesis calendar, as I call it. Uh, call it. So, yeah, he was on uh, that calendar, not the Exodus calendar, uh, or the, uh, you know, I call it the Exodus calendar, the biblical calendar uh, in Exodus, Exodus 12, 2. Adam would have been on, and Noah would have been on, and all those guys before Moses would have been on the, excuse me, the civil calendar. Four eighty three has passed away. Yep, we're waiting on that final week, and man, that is a great debate about the final week. Whether a lot of people are pointing to it this this uh, feast of trumpets for the seven years, and some are pointing later, but um, you know, time will tell. We're going to have to uh, just see what the Lord does. But I think there's a marker where we know that there is a seven years left, and that is an agreement that is made uh, or covenant, so to speak, with Israel and also other nations. So we'll just have to wait and see. I believe that will be on the Feast of Trumpets, and that will start the seven-year period. So we'll just have to see what happens. So yeah, I really appreciate everybody joining us. I know we've been on for about two hours now, and uh, we're about to be at sundown here on the East Coast uh, here in Florida. So I just want to really appreciate, um, you know, everybody uh, joining us. Uh, yeah, yeah, David, yeah, Daniel 9, 24 through 27. That's a good scripture for everybody to understand uh, with the timing of the seven-year tribulation period. Uh, just like David mentioned, it clearly goes through. There's an agreement for one week, Daniel's 70th week, and in the middle of the week, he breaks the covenant, you know, so we've discussed that with the abomination of desolation, with Satan being thrown out of heaven, literally on the earth, in, uh, incarnating the Antichrist at the three and a half year mark. That all ties in together very beautifully. But yeah, Daniel 9, 27, or 24 through 27 is a very good uh, scripture to understand eschatology and to understand the prophetic events uh, that will happen in chronological order, just like Matthew 24 is. Matthew 24 is the same thing. Matthew 24 is a chronological prof a prophecy of God himself, Yeshua, telling us what's going to happen, the three and a half year mark, abomination of desolation. Go read Daniel, he says, and then what will happen after that. And then it says, immediately after the tribulation, I will come and get y'all, is what it says in 
in uh, Georgia terms, uh, I will come and get, he didn't say y'all, but he says, I'll come and get the believers. So um, that's what I personally believe uh, with that. And he tells us exactly, that's why I believe that um, there is no pre-trib rapture. Uh, he comes after the tribulation one time uh, on the day of the Lord, you know, and um, if I'm wrong, then great. I will be ready on the Feast of Trumpets. But like I tell people, um, if people believe in a pre-trib rapture, that's of course your, uh, your right to do that. But just be ready if you are wrong to go through the worst time in human history, which is a seven year period, which I believe personally, when we look at the pre-trib rapture, that's the uh, concern I have for believers is they believe we're gonna be taken out and we're not gonna to have to go through the seven years. And for someone, when that event does happen with the agreement, and if we are here for seven years, then someone really has to get spiritually, emotionally, physically ready to go through the seven years. So it really would really give a shock and awe to somebody's theology if they are 100% banking on being taken out of here. Um, that's to me a very dangerous proposition you know, to just be dogmatic about it, you know, and, and not to be open to where, hey, what if I'm wrong, you know, and I have to go through it. I want to be prepared. I want to have my family prepared. I want to do my part in the gospel with the Great Commission and all of these things. So I would just say that in, um, in love to someone that uh, just not be so dogmatic. If, if you are pre-trib, what if you're wrong? You know, if I'm wrong, you know, then I don't lose anything because I'll be ready on the Feast of Trumpets on pre-trib. But if I'm, if we have the right understanding of it, that he's coming after the, right after the tribulation, uh, then, you know, we don't have anything to lose because we'll be prepared to go through it spiritually, emotionally, and physically, and, and that sort of thing. So I hope that makes sense. I know it's a very debatable uh, conversation about the rapture and things like that. And uh, sometimes I kind of get discouraged with it because it takes away from what we should be doing. Instead of hoping to be raptured and resurrected and get out of here, we should be doing the gospel. We should be doing the Great Commission. We should be doing our part in God's kingdom instead of just saying, okay, well, we're going to be raptured anyhow, and that's the Jews' problem. You know, I think that's very um, irresponsible personally uh, to look at it that way. And it's not the Great Commission. It's not the heart of the gospel uh, whatsoever. And if God chooses to bring us out of this on pre-trib, then hallelujah, you know, and we'll all be ready, but I would not be dogmatic um, about that at all, you know, in case that there is a misunderstanding through the scriptures. So uh, that's just my personal uh, take on it. And um, uh, hopefully that doesn't offend anybody, but that's just my personal opinion that uh, we just all need to be very careful with being dogmatic towards really anything except for Yeshua is the Messiah. <laughs> he is the son of God and uh, we are his children. You know, and uh, some of the prophecies, we just have to make sure that we um, are not dogmatic and we have a true understanding of it to be edified, to listen to other people, to be open and to edify it and to pray about it. And then if, if it doesn't stick, it doesn't stick. But if it does, it does. So uh, that's just my personal uh, opinion on that. Keep up the good work, David, man. Keep up the good work with what you're doing uh, for the kingdom. Hey, Melissa, shalom to you. Yeah, we're about to get off, but, um, you know, we've got two hours of video if you want to uh, rewatch it. There was some good content in it, a lot of great comments, a lot of great edification going on. I mean, it's, it's been a beautiful uh, live video and a beautiful event. I love you, David, man. Same here, man. Same to you, buddy. Let's catch up soon, man. Uh, Shuri, thank you for joining us. I hope you join us again. You know, I try to do these. Um, I've been doing them once a month because of my schedule and things like that. I've been in transition uh, with moving, uh, et cetera. But um, I'm hopeful. I'm starting to do these maybe once a week, once every two weeks, because I've really enjoyed um, not being in a green screen room, even though I do enjoy that. And it paints a beautiful picture with the scriptures and stuff and the points. But I really enjoy the interaction with you and other and everybody on here. Uh, I've really enjoyed it tremendously, you know, over the past two months of really when I've been doing them. I do one on the new moon every um, month, but I'm gonna start just probably doing most videos uh, live and then I'll, I will do some green screen 
uh, studies and stuff like that as well. But I've truly enjoyed it. So thank you for joining us. And I hope we see you again soon. You brought a lot of great points up, a lot of great edification uh, as well. So we really appreciate you joining us. And uh, hopefully we'll see you uh, here back. I agree with you, Matt. I totally agree with that, with the resurrection. And if uh, I spoke out of context, I mean that, you know, some people are just worried about being taken away. You know, um, I do believe in we should be looking for the blessed hope of the resurrection for sure. But uh, not that we should just be taken away and just, you know, we shouldn't be doing our part in God's kingdom. So I just wanted to clarify that. But yeah, thank you for that, man. And I totally agree with that. Amen. And I agree with you, Shuri, as well uh, with that, that we are looking for the blessed hope. But until that time, we need to be doing our part in God's kingdom, you know, and um, moving forward. Amen. Well, ladies and gents, it's been a pleasure. It's been a blessing. Um, you know, I've been fasting all day, so I'm about to go eat uh, here at sundown uh, at 830. We're going to go uh, have a feast uh, to the Lord, so to speak. So we really appreciate everybody joining us. It's good to see the new ones and the old friends. It's good to see you guys as well. Uh, Matt, David, it's always nice to see and fellowship with you guys. Hopefully we see you guys uh, here soon. Uh, we'll be doing a video here soon. Uh, and obviously it'll be on YouTube and stuff. And we hope that uh, we fellowship with you guys very soon. Uh, we'll be doing a new moon video, obviously, when Av comes around here uh, in about 12 days. Uh, we'll be doing a new moon video as well. And so we really appreciate everybody joining us. Uh, let's keep on keeping on, as I say, and keep doing our part in God's kingdom. And uh, we'll see you guys very soon. And as, as always, may God bless everybody. You know, may God bless you. May he keep you. May his face shine upon you guys and give you his grace. And may he lift up his countenance upon you, your family, and give you guys his everlasting shalom forever and ever. I really appreciate everybody joining us on this Saturday night. Have a great night. Have a great rest of the weekend. And I will see you guys very, very, very soon. Uh, shalom to you and stay blessed. We love you guys.